Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Marshall. I'm with Green Mountain Consulting, and this is our second year to actually sponsor. Uh, some of you have actually come up and said, uh, you know, I, I actually drink Green Mountain coffee, and of course, I'm, my comment back to y'all is that that's great. They're a client of ours, but, you know, it's Green Mountain Consulting. What, what we actually do is uh, we actually do parcel spend management. So people that actually spend $30 million or more with FedEx and UPS, we help manage that at another level. One of the opportunities that we have in actually being here is our, uh, our clients are like Costco, Kohl's, uh, Toys R Us, but being able to be in a, an environment like this, which is really a learning organization. When Peter Singe wrote the book, uh, uh, Fifth Discipline, he talked about companies actually creating a learning environment. To me, this is a unique thing about what we've been able to do here as far as in this, uh, in this given situation of sharing knowledge. Uh, it's my opportunity uh, to introduce the uh, program of unveiling the digital DNA. Uh, Rob Garf, uh, Vice President of uh, Product and Solutions Marketing, uh, Demandware. Um, he's no stranger to this industry. He has more than 20 years of retail experience. Uh, and we also have Dr. Anita uh, Bupa, and uh, she is the PetSmart uh, Associate Professor of Retailing and Consumer Science. She's an expert as far as in conducting the qualitative and quantitative research to develop, evaluate, and improve business strategy, team performance, and service delivery systems. Uh, it was my pleasure to welcome Rob and Anita. Well, good morning, and Kevin, thanks so much for that kind introduction. Again, my name is Rob Garf. I'm with Demandware. For those of you who may not know who we are, we're a cloud-based digital commerce platform that helps companies like Tory Burch and Clarins and Kate Spade, Columbia, Pier One, Brooks Brothers, and others grow in this new retail reality. And given the role we play connecting retailers with consumers across devices, channels and geographies, we really wanted to get in the mind and the head of the new digital consumer. I came to the show for the last year for the first time and was so impressed with the content, the networking, the presentations, and the students, I was fortunate enough to be connected to Anita and the school along with Charles Lowry, who's a doctoral student. Charles is in the front row, stand, say hello. <laughs> to put you on the spot for a minute to actually conduct primary research to really, again, understand this fashion consumer. What we were able to uncover was this emerging and extremely valuable consumer, which we've coined the digital divas. And here today, we're going to get into the details of how they shop, where they shop, and really what drives their behavior. So Anita, you want to give a little detail on how we did the research? Yes, so we decided to look at consumers both in the US and in a couple of European markets. And the work we did was survey-based, and we had approximately 7,400 consumers respond to the survey. So that's what the data are about. And we focused on fashion products because that's primary, primarily what Rob's clientele are interested in. And we essentially talked to consumers who at least had purchased one fashion item during the past three months, and they were 18 years or older. So that's where we started as a platform of data. So thinking about who the consumers are and the digital divas in particular, um, we decided to try to identify a segment that was both highly engaged in fashion and highly engaged in technology. And so we were looking to see among the multitude of consumers who buy fashion goods, are there a set of consumers that we could define as being high, high on these two levels? And in particular, we didn't want to look at how much they spent. We wanted to look at behaviors that were indicative of their engagement so that we could look at them across a broad range of demographics. So the definition of the diva isn't tied to demographics, it's tied to the fact that they love fashion and they use a lot of technology. And so in exploring the data and in asking them questions about how they shopped, and that is really the focus of the research is how, not necessarily what, 
um, we discovered that digital divas who are high on technology engagement use 3.7 technologies across all of those, always or almost always, compared to less than one for their non-diva counterparts. So to begin with, that was one thing that put them into the category of interest. And on the other side, we looked at a variety of indicators that they were interested in fashion, not necessarily could afford it even, but were interested in fashion. And again, they stood out as having very high interest relative to the non-divas. And that's where we start with the digital diva. And the diva had to rate high in both these areas, correct. correct? So now that you get a high level definition of the digital diva, we want to know, are you a diva? So pull out your phones and we're going to do a quick survey here. So are you a digital diva? Now, as you ponder this question, and we give you a second, I'll give you a quick anecdote. We had our user conference last week in Las Vegas, had Tim Gunn from Project Runway, keynote. And he got up there, he said, Rob, I read your report. I looked in the mirror, I was very retrospective, and I asked myself, am I a digital diva? And you know what he said? Yes, I'm a digital diva. So you're in good company if you say yes. Give you another second to decide, and let's bring up the results, see how we fare. Oh wow, look at this. <laughs> yes, we are digital diva. I'm not gonna tell you what I'm wearing today because you'd see that I'm probably not a digital diva, but that's really interesting. This is actually much higher than the world average. So let's go to the next slide so you can see how the 7,500 consumers rated themselves. So when we get to the next slide, you'll see that <laughs> digital divas actually comprise 22% of the fashion market. So a relatively small number when you see that, on contrast, 41% are neither fashion engaged or digitally engaged. Okay, 22%, about one in five fashion consumers. And while we continually say fashion consumers, because Anita's taught me to be uh, very high integrity with the numbers that we see. <laughs> I'm a marketing guy, so I like to play with some of the numbers, but she keeps me very honest. It's about one in five, however, want to be careful that while these are fashion consumers, certainly these consumers are shopping in other categories like home improvement and sporting goods and so forth. Now there are some differences by geography. You'll see the US comprises the highest rate of these digital divas where France, given the relatively low digital engagement, is only at 15%. Germany, contrast to France, has relatively higher digital engagement, but relatively lower fashion engagement. You can see here, again, 22% of the market are these digital divas. So with that, you're wondering, so who are they? 69% of you, apparently. But they're just as likely to be male as they're female. So the idea that this is only a female consumer is false. It's not supported at all. And in fact, I think most surprising to me was that 64% of the digital divas fall between the ages of 25 and 44, which is a lot older than I had expected. So it sort of helps to put in perspective who they are as we start to uncover that and unveil it. 71% of them are primary wage earners, and in the US, 64% of digital divas have household incomes of 75,000 or higher. In fact, 27% of them have household incomes of $100,000 or higher. So this is not you know, your teenager or, and, or your young adult necessarily just out of college, but we're talking about a slightly more mature segment of the population. And most of them are married with kids. So these are folks who care about how they look and what they buy, and in particular, who they're buying from. But they're also very busy, and that could be part of the reason why they're digitally engaged. Their time is of essence, and they do get time value of money, which shows up in many different aspects of their behaviors and their psychology. So here's the money slide, both figuratively and literally. So while they comprise 22% of the market, they encompass a whopping 69% of the purchasing power. 
So 29% is direct spend, them taking out their wallet and spending directly on merchandise. But what's most intriguing is the influencing power they have. They influence 40% of the fashion spend primarily to non-divas. So as Anita just talked about, extremely time-starved, their primary wage earners are in the prime of their career with kids, but they still take the time and have the motivation to influence others. So let me be clear. Certainly we know some of the fashion bloggers out there today, whether it's Jane Aldridge or Carmen, who I particularly really enjoy, or Rumi from Fashion Toast. But this is peeling one layer back and thinking about the influencers who really influence, the masses, the 22% that are out there every day on their mobile devices, in the store, talking to friends, and really influencing. A whopping 40%, which equals 69%. Worldwide, this is a, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars of purchases that they're influencing annually. So why is this important? You'll hear from Tori Birch herself later today. Mickey, who's in the first row here, talks about the idea of the brand ambassador. If you know that these individuals are talking about you, you want to hear them talking about you positively. You heard it from Jonathan yesterday at Clarins around these addicts. These addicts are not just important, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, given what they spend directly, but what they're doing and they're talking. Uh, Doug talked about yesterday, One King's Lane, I think it was 64% of their consumers will reference or recommend them to others. That's what you want. You want the sphere of influence to really create this pinwheel effect where these consumers, these digital divas are out there being brand advocates for you. So before I jump into some of the details about how they shop, and this slide gets into that, I thought I would start a new trend for the day and talk about how I bought my suit. <clears throat> so insofar as I was directed that I needed to wear a suit, um, I started with a Google search for plus size women's suits. Not a retailer search, not a brand search, simply where am I gonna find something online? And from that proceeded to find a few retailers who I knew that sold suits at a pretty competitive price. Decided I didn't have time to go and find one in store, which apparently wasn't, the, the suit I was interested in wasn't even in store in Tucson. So I ordered two different sizes and had them delivered to the store, went into the store, tried them on, returned the one that didn't fit, and bought the shirt and walked out. And that gives you a sense of how the mobile and the physical are interspaced or interwoven in the shopping process for the digital divas. So as we delve into the data a bit more, I chose some terms to try to give you an idea of who they are and how they shop. And so when we talk about shopping destinations, they're digital divas, but the place that they shop the most is the physical retail store. 70% of them will always or almost always hit a retail store in that process of shopping. 50% of them almost always or always are online on their computer in one form or another hitting different destinations to inform themselves about what it is that they're buying, what it is that they're interested in, and who carries it. So in terms of the destinations, they're fragmented in where they go, but they go to a lot of places compared to the non-divas. So it's not a one-stop shop experience. It's a multi-destination shopping process, and it can start just as likely in the physical store as it can online or mobile, and then switch in terms of the final execution. In terms of being informed, when they're trying to make a decision about what to buy, they're consulting on average always or almost always 3.5 different information sources compared to the rest of the population of fashion shoppers who essentially look at less than one. And so this again tells you a little bit about how they approach the shopping process. And I like to term it in this way, which is that they spend a lot of time in the search and discovery 
parts of the decision-making process. The final buy, the final execution is important, but what happens before they decide what to buy is just as important to understand how to connect with them and quite frankly, how to influence what it is they end up purchasing. And again, as Rob alluded to, these are very social beings. They are connected, not just to you as retailers through various devices, but to their networks of friends and family who, like them, don't have much time, but take the time to share. And we'll get into why they share in just a few slides. But again, I think it's important to note that on average, they're interacting with almost two different social networks, always or almost always during a fashion purchase, either to seek information on what to buy and or to share information about what they are about to buy. So I think it becomes, again, a sort of idea around how they shop. And the final, sli the final bullet point here, I think, is potentially the most interesting for the folks in the room, is that if you think about what <clears throat> we heard yesterday, that consumer spending isn't going to grow in terms of a market expansion. It's going to come for, for you as a retailer from the spending that someone else currently has. So it's about share. It's not about necessarily the whole boat being lifted anymore, at least for the near term. And when you look at the divas, they're definitely more loyal than the non-divas when it comes to having a favorite retailer, but I like to think of them as untethered because it's still 60% that aren't tethered to anybody. So the opportunity is quite large, but I also think it's important to reflect on whether there's even such a thing as a favorite retailer anymore for this type of consumer because they're, they're buying from a lot of different venues and a lot of different people. So the idea of loyalty itself may look different moving forward. And when we look at fragmentation, two key areas of interaction are social media and also mobile. So if you point yourself to the bottom left, you'll see two times by a mobile device. This indicates that digital divas are actually two times more likely to use a mobile device within a physical store, right? Which is pretty unbelievable given this interconnectivity and their willingness to share and influence, uh, they can do it instantaneously. Now what we found, and Anita's gonna dive into some of the details, uh, this is for the positive, right? So you see here a lot about showrooming, and moving quickly away, we heard an anecdote yesterday of how that happened from Kevin, a direct experience, but they're using it actually for the goodness to communicate and influence. And also some of the other areas are finding product. This actually rated the highest. Finding product that's not physically in the store and entering into an endless aisle environment to be able to find the product wherever, whenever they want it. The other piece, and this actually came out really high in the UK, was the willingness to use a mobile device so that the consumer can be identified while walking in the store and offered a promotion. Uh, we think this is because of some of uh, the more progressive loyalty programs from the likes of Tesco and Sainsbury and others who have gotten to more of a personalized uh, interaction and personalized promotion. So there's a willingness uh, to give in order to get. Uh, so we're seeing, again, the mobile device really fundamentally changing the in-store environment. We've heard a lot about this, and we think uh, this will actually cause retailers in the not-too-distant future to rethink their entire store system stack, moving away from really the hardwired in-store processor-based point of sale and having more of a virtual point of sale that recognizes this mobile shopper uh, that is weaving in and out of both the physical and virtual worlds. We're seeing this with clients of ours today, like Best Seller in Europe and House of Fraser, who have created virtual point of sales on our e-commerce platform to really cater to this digital diva and the reality that's happening uh, across the mobile spectrum. So given this huge shift, the seismic shift in mobile, and also what we're talking about as it relates to the opinion sharing of these digital divas, we wanted to peel it one level deeper to really get into the psyche of this individual. So Anita's gonna dive into the details into terms of what really motivates the digital diva to both share opinions and use their mobile device in the store. So I think I wanna start by just trying to give you a very high level view of this. 
And <clears throat> the way I would express this is that the digital divas are not just information brokers, they're innovative communicators. They're curating the information they share based on the experiences they have and or the values that they hold. And so insofar as they are your brand ambassador, the editorial nature of what they're doing becomes important. And that's important in both ways. It could be for the positive, but it could also be for the negative in terms of how quickly it is and how easily it is for them to share. So at that level, I think it's a, it's a big sort of umbrella to consider. The other thing that this story tells is this is all about social capital. It's about how you derive social capital by helping them grow their own social capital. And that's what's motivating their desire to share and or their use of mobile in store. So we're gonna delve a little bit deeper, but I just wanted to point out that in terms of the drivers between the two questions, what drives them to share, what drives them to use mobile in store, there's one common element or indicator, and that's fashion forward, at least that's the term we gave it. And what this describes is that the divas are very concerned about managing impressions. In this case, fashion impressions. So they care about who's in, what's cool, and what people think, people in their network think about what they're doing. And this desire and this need to manage the impressions of others and insofar as manage their own impression management, seeking advice from others, drives both those behaviors in common. So that's the fashion forward button. So we can go to the next slide. We're gonna delve a little bit deeper again into why do they share? It's an interesting question. And I've tried to cut the story really simple for the audience here, so I'm gonna delve into it. If you want a much more high level, uh, multi-model uh, explanation, you can speak to Charles, who's doing his dissertation on this. But just to give you a top line view, there are three primary drivers of this. Aside from being fashion forward, the divas care a lot about the product quality. And that's not simply the brand. It's about the durability of the product, the sustainability of the product, it's whether the product wears according to expectation, it's the price value equation in their mind, what am I paying for and what am I getting? And insofar as you live up to those expectations, then you're gonna get a positive social boost in their network. But if you don't, you're gonna get the other side of the coin. And so again, they're being driven by a great interest in product and they share a lot because of that. And I think the, the third bucket or the third bullet is somewhat the most interesting to me, is in many ways, fashion spending for the divas is a way to self-indulge. You know, it's the gold pair of earrings I bought when I was grocery shopping with my infant at Costco. Just because I could, and they were there, and they were a great price, and you know, I could indulge. But it's those little presents that I give myself to reward myself, and insofar as I do that, I share that and validate it with my network, and talk about that benefit I get by being a retail customer in some particular venue or a brand loyal customer in some particular site. And so again, they're motivated to share in part because they feel good about themselves and they want the validation of that and or they want simply to share that experience so that it could potentially be a way for their friends and family that they're connected to, to also self-indulge. And, and that's part of what drives them to share. So Anita, though, you talk about social capital, but what about actual you know, financial capital or the reward around finances and being somewhat compensated for their sharing and opinions? So I think one caveat is we didn't ask them. We didn't ask them, do you get paid to share? We, that wasn't part of the, the questions. But I think if you look at what we see in the data, it's pretty clear that the benefits that accrue to them are social in nature. And Insofar as they're accruing those benefits because you provide great services and products, 
then you share value with them in creating that shared value because they're going to help you build your own social capital. So we often talk about creating shared value in the context of corporate social responsibility. It's sort of a similar view here in that you can create shared social capital with your consumers in this, in this arena. And I think an important note as well is this model holds in the negative it explains why the non-divas don't share as well. This model holds for both why people share. If you're high on all those three things, you're more likely to share, and the divas are high on all those three things. If you're not as high, or you don't indicate as high on all those three things, you're less likely to share. And so you can look at your consumer base and consider how to connect with them if you indeed want them to share on your behalf. And going to mobile in-store, the set of questions we asked um, tried to give them an array of the currently supported options for using mobile in-store. So we asked them things like, would you use your mobile device to identify yourself as a loyal customer so you can get some type of special promotion? Would you use your mobile device to scan a tag and be able to look up product information? Would you use your mobile device to order out-of-stock product if it's shipped to your home for free? Would you use your mobile device to share something you saw in store with a friend or on your social network? So those are the sort of sets of questions that we ask them. And when we look again at what drives them, interesting because of the show roaming concern, is that it's actually just another way for them to reward you for giving, the, giving them the opportunity to execute that sale. Right there, right then. That's the loyal shopper piece. In other words, I don't really want to have to go home and have to look up the price information and take the time then to find and fulfill it online. I'd rather just execute in store if I see it there. So let me, help me do that. Give me the technology so that I can take the time not to have to do it later on in the day or later on at night and execute right in store. So the loyalty factor is big here. It's a big driver for the consumer. And I think to Kevin's point yesterday, let them look. Give them the information on how you compare with price. Give them the information about where this product comes from. Enable them to share it on their network so that they get validation from their friends that it's what I, I should buy. Yeah, I bought it. Because they're all connected, and they'll get that before they walk out, the, out of the store, quite frankly, before they leave the aisle, to be able to feel good about that purchase and complete that purchase in store. And so that's what we see here. And I think the, the closet couponer is an interesting um, piece of work that comes from some other work I did around digital couponing, but what it says is essentially that these folks are not coupon clippers, but they like promotions. They like getting deals. And if you give them a deal on their mobile or in some type of digital format, they'll use it. But to ask them to clip coupons and bring them in and print them at home, one is something they won't do, and two, they affiliate it with sort of being cheap or being not cool, and they manage impressions, remember? So this is a group of people that aren't interested in deals that come in a paper format, but they're very likely to use them and to avail of themselves uh, those deals in store if you present them to them at the right time. Great. So as we put a bow around this, let's talk about why should we care and what do we do? All right, so you can read the words on the page, but two points I want to make here. First of all, these are the affiliates of today, right? So we all remember affiliate programs back in 99 and 2000. You put a little logo on a page, you hope somebody clicks through, and you give somebody a certain percent for that affiliate fee. These are the affiliates of today. A lot of business, a lot of commerce is running through. Again, they're not motivated for any commission, but they're motivated on that social capital. Second, while these are the fashion leaders and the influencers of today, they are the bellwether of tomorrow. You can apply them and they're only going to grow over time to any segment of retail that you can imagine. So they're important to understand and cater to. So what do you do? Where do I start? First of all, enhance the digital engagement, right? The virtual and physical worlds have collided and they're only going to continue to collide 
and retailers must rethink the way they put together their platform to really understand this fragmented shopping experience and weave together their experience and do it in a way that has a consistency around inventory, as Terry talked about yesterday, or customer information, product information, and so forth. The other piece is increase fashion engagement. And really, the first thing is listen. You heard it from Clarence yesterday in the feedback card that they've been doing for a long time. Listen to them, understand them, not only in the front lines on customer service, but understand how that might influence your product direction and development. And the second piece is leverage your sales associates. They are your biggest brand ambassador. They have their feet on the street and they understand and have their pulse on what the consumer is saying. I remember doing a report as an industry analyst about six, seven years ago on advanced selling technologies and a Wall Street Journal reporter asked me, does this mean you can cut store labor by 20% because you're gonna have a kiosk, you're gonna have a digital device here and there? I didn't get uh, sucked into that answer, of course, but what I said is no, not at all. These devices are going to empower these store associates more so than ever before and make them as smart or smarter than these digital divas who are well-informed, well-connected, and obviously immensely uh, influential. So hopefully you found this information as exciting to you as we did. Uh, we think the digital divas are here to stay. We think we have an opportunity as an industry uh, to cater to them, understand them, and certainly embrace them in the overall ecosystem of our environment. So thank you so much for your time today and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.